Our next guest uh, will be on in a few seconds. I'm very pleased to announce him again. It's uh, Bitcom's Patrick Hansen, and he will talk to us about, and probably seamlessly integrate to the last talk, uh, further challenges on the road to mass adoption for decentralized finance. And yes. I see you're on with us now, Patrick. Okay, let's then I, I just start. Uh, thank you very much, Marcel, for the kind introduction. And hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Patrick Hansen. I'm head of blockchain at Bitcom. Bitcom is the uh, largest tech association in Europe with over 2,000 member companies. And um, give me one second. Okay, so, sorry. So for the short delay. So yeah, Bitcom is the largest tech association in Europe with over 2,000 member companies. And And many of the companies here present at the CAC, if not most of them, are also active in our crypto and blockchain working groups, where we mostly work on regulation and regulatory topics together with the regulatory stakeholders, both in Germany and the EU. And I think my present today, presentation today builds up very well um, on uh, what uh, um, has been said before. Give me one second. I would try to... Um, change the sharing of the slides. Opa. Okay, that should work better now. Um, so my goal is to talk about DeFi's greatest challenges. And uh, in order to do that, I will shed some light on the recent developments in the DeFi sector and how basically DeFi went through the recent crash before moving on to um, the challenges, the, mo the more, most important challenges I see for the sector, the technical ones and the regulatory ones. And since we have a quite a tight agenda, let's directly uh, jump in. So how um, did the DeFi application and protocols do um, within like uh, uh, the, this period of high volatility? And the most important um, uh, the most important uh, criterion or DeFi uh, aspect is the total value lock that has already been mentioned. Uh, that was down uh, 42% on the uh, 19th of May, so on the day with the highest volatility. Um, alongside uh, the total value locked, uh, we saw the Tf DeFi token drawdowns of uh, 70% and more. So the DeFi token suffered even more than uh, the, I would say, the, the more um, mature uh, or the already older and, and, and um, more um, known assets, assets such as BTC and ETH, uh, which is not very surprising. Uh, but one number that has remained stable is the ETH supply in um, smart contracts that stayed uh, at 23% uh, throughout the sell-off. But let's, let's now zoom in and look at a couple of DeFi applications that are most prominent. And let's start with the decentralized exchanges. Um, so uh, th this is kind of interesting. While all the centralized exchanges, for example, Coinbase, Kraken, uh, Binance US, Bitstamp, basically all of them went down. The decentralized exchanges were up and, and running at record volumes, so almost 12, 12 billion dominated by Uniswap with almost 6 billion. And apart from the record volume, um, there was also a, um, a daily traders uh, volume with uh, um, 1 million um, daily traders in, in 30 days um, surpassed for the first time. So quite a positive sign for decentralized finance that exchanging tokens was still possible. Um, let's look at another important DeFi sector, the stable coins. Um, here, uh, very promising and, and very impressive that the top three stable coins on Ether, um, so USDT, Tether, um, USDC, and DAI, um, all not deviated from their pack, so all remain stable. And that is um, impressive, especially for DAI uh, that has lost its pack during the last important crash in March 2020. This time, uh, the collateral mechanisms, the, um, the pack mechanisms worked out smoothly. 
Um, the, the highest spreads were only a couple of cents and only lasted for a couple of seconds on some of the exchanges. So um, basically, all the major stable coins remained stable apart from one um, a, a smaller DeFi stable coin called a Terra USD. And apart from holding the pack, the stable coins also saw some record um, stable coin transfer volume of uh, 52 billion. Um, which, which is uh, quite impressive um, um, for, for DeFi. And uh, looking at the last uh, biggest uh, or last uh, great DeFi sector, the lending and borrowing markets, um, one can say that um, while there has, have been a record, label, a record level liquidations of up to 600 million during um, this day of, of market crash or these days of market crashes, um, those liquidations are only high in absolute numbers and, and, and not really important in, in, in relative terms. And more importantly, those liquidations didn't lead to, um, for example, the, the loss of uh, the collateral or um, the, vol the volatility of collateral requirements for lenders, um, basically also supported, supported by the stable coins uh, staying stable. Um, we saw a stable interest rate, a, a stable rate of utilization, which is basically the rate, um, the percentage rate of the collateral that is used in, um, in borrowing. Uh, all that stayed healthy. So basically all the liquidation and arbitrage mechanisms worked as intended. And uh, this is very positive, a positive indicator for DeFi. A major downturn, uh, downside, uh, I mean, I think you're all aware of that during the Days of the market crash, the gas price just skyrocketed. Um, on May 19th, it, it was over 1,200, um, which uh, yeah, it, it basically means that a, a single swap on, on Uniswap, for example, would cost several hundreds of dollars, uh, and and that price basically drives the retail uh, a trader totally completely out of the of the market. So that is obviously negative. While the um, services, the applications are up and running, they are basically um, uh, no longer attractive or, or feasible for the retail user. And another interesting aspect, uh, the transaction volumes went, went up on Ethereum, but the total transactions uh, fell. So that means it's largely large holders that are moving risk, that, that are benefiting from arbitrage or that are um, basically shifting stable coins around. And um, that brings me to my uh, conclusion of the DeFi stress test. Uh, basically, it was the first major price and liquidity test since DeFi grew quite substantially to, to uh, 100 billion almost locked in those smart contracts and to almost 2 million users. And if you look at those different uh, DeFi application, DAXs, lending, stable coins, all show very promising and very healthy and positive indicators of how they reacted. The only downside being really that those gas prices are now obviously not sustainable and obviously um, also dangerous uh, for, for market efficiencies and especially for, for the retail market. Um, but overall, that's a positive uh, indicator and a positive narrative, especially when it comes to uh, upcoming regulation in the future, that those mechanisms really worked as intended, not as in March 2020, where um, several liquidity problems uh, led to exploits and, and uh, stable coins lost their packs, uh, et cetera. So that, as a quick um, maybe intro, uh, um, a, a, an insight into um, how DeFi reacted to the market crash. And that brings me basically after that positive um, feedback to the two biggest risks I see in DeFi going forward is basically the technical challenges. I see mostly security, scalability, and usability challenges, and then the regulatory challenges that, I, in my opinion, are even more important. Um, let's jump into it. Um, the technical challenges, let me start with the security risks, uh, almost 300 million lost due to hacks since 2019, quite substan substantial. So while the overall amount of hacks in crypto in 2020 decreased, almost half of them were 
uh, can be attributed to the DeFi sector, which is obviously concerning. I listed a couple of uh, potential remedies here on the right side. So uh, third party audits, uh, for example, um, that are becoming more and more mainstream, uh, but obviously don't offer 100% assurance. Uh, DeFi and CeFi insurance schemes like Nexus Mutual that are growing rapidly, uh, regu regulation that could uh, help in the form of uh, risk management procedures, capital, capital buffers, or even processes of good governance, for example, when it comes to the freezing of certain funds or smart contracts. And last but not least, obviously, a lot of those hacks or exploits are due to oracles um, in combination with the aforementioned uh, flash loans uh, in the presentation from block size capital. And uh, decentralized oracles and, uh, like Chainlink are a promising solution to that external data risk. Uh, another major technical challenge is the scalability and the liquidity of the whole sector. Um, obviously, in those times of uh, high gas prices, that leads to a transaction in pending states, which uh, leads to market inefficiencies and information delays. And more importantly, even than that, um, it just makes retail users uh, go out of the market and uh, take out their um, liquidity and, and, and that obviously leads to diminishing usage and, and liquidity in those uh, smart contracts and DeFi protocols, which is then uh, connected to the liquidity risk. If there's few liquidity, for example, due to missing uh, retail market users or due to missing arbitrageurs and professional liquidity providers that keep prices in line, uh, that obviously has the potential for a massive dislocation on, on those marketplaces and uh, to create uncertainty and then uh, really unforeseeable market drops like in March 2020. And the last uh, technical uh, challenge I wanted to mention here, and I think there's no better way to visualize that then this very famous DeFi meme is that uh, I guess whoever has already transacted in DeFi is aware of how complicated that is. And um, I think we are all aware of this usability uh, not being uh, ready for mass market adoption yet. And uh, so we should all work uh, um, as also as an industry to make that better. There are some promising solutions such as front-end aggregators or very uh, user-friendly non-custodial DeFi wallets such as Argent and um, pro possibly that will get better and better in the future. So I'm, I'm quite positive um, and optimistic about that. Um, something that is more challenging uh, than that, and I will try to spend a couple of minutes on the regulatory challenge, is how will the DeFi sector be regulated? Um, so while it, uh, the DeFi sector exhibits some of the same abstract fun functions right, uh, as the traditional sector when it comes to exchanging or lending, borrowing, uh, issuing or, um, or managing assets. It is uh, not at all clear how DeFi should be regulated. Obviously, it, off it exhibits some of the same functions or abstract functions, but it's um, very different when it comes to the organizational and technical setup. So basically, it's non-custodial. There's no central counterparty uh, um, that oversees the whole DeFi tech stack uh, normally. And it, it's built as open source software on, on, on public blockchains and is totally transparent. So there are major differences here. And that obviously raises a lot of important questions on the regulatory side. Um, basically, the major ones being who should be regulated and, and how should that regulation be enforced? So on the left hand side, the, the, the question is, is there a central owner operator of those services that benefits from a price increase, for example, and when it comes to the token issuance, and then that could be regulated. But even if there is not one single operator and owner of the whole tech stack of the DeFi applications, there are some more specific questions when it comes to different tech layers, DeFi tech layers, for example, the application layer, so the website, the UX, the question is, are those website builders then possibly even transmitting orders and providing regulated financial services? Um, are developers uh, on, 
uh, on it on a similar uh, question providing um, regulated financial services in the form of executing orders and our mining or stakers operating uh, trading platforms so these are regulatory gray areas that are not clarified for now and even the question the, the, uh, for regulators is even if they answer those questions with yes and they see those um, different uh, parties involved in regulated financial services. The question is, how should that regulation be enforced? Um, since normally the developers just working on open source software can't really be forced to comply. The question is, what consequences would that have on the economy, on the financial sector? Would that drive the innovation and uh, those applications out of the market, underground or off seas, offshore? That, that are important questions. And the, a key um, problem is that normally at the beginning um, of those uh, DeFi project initiatives, they are obviously highly centralized and, and led by a central team, but they will get more decentralized over time. And the question is how to balance basically that um, transition from a central initiative to a decentralized application. Just a quick look, uh, since I have to hurry up on different initiatives. so. A very positive um, development also um, um, thanks to a lot of talks with European stakeholders is that um, now a new recital has been added in the markets and crypto asset regulation stating that services that are not provided or controlled um, by a service provider will not be covered by Mika. Um, I mean, everything depends obviously on the, by, on the definition of a service provider, but that's a very strong and positive sign that DeFi will not fall under um, the Mika. Um, in the USA, um, there are some very promising proposals from the SEC um, to establish a token safe harbor proposal that basically would be some kind of sandboxing regime where DeFi initiatives would have uh, two, three minutes, uh, two, three years of, of time to decentralize their initiatives. And something that is a little bit concerning on an international level is the FATF guidelines um, that state that um, entities involved um, with dApps, so with decentralized applications, could fall under the definition of a VASP as a virtual asset service provider and could then be forced to comply with anti-money laundering um, requirements, for example. So the key takeaways is DeFi is small, but uh, growing and with greater adoption comes greater regulatory scrutiny. Uh, the recent uh, crash stress test shows that DeFi is increasingly resilient, but in my opinion, apart from other risks that I didn't have the time to mention, the technology and the regulation are really the two main pillars when it comes to moving forwards towards a mass market. And with that said, I want uh, to invite everyone to work on those topics, uh, especially on the regulation side within our association alongside those active members in our blockchain and crypto working groups, feel free to reach out to me and to contact me. Uh, we're always looking for new members and for those who want to give a, a closer read and a closer look into the topic, here are two more in detail um, reading suggestions from my side. And with that said, um, uh, uh, Marcel, I can still not hear you, uh, but thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to the rest of the conference. Thank you very much, Patrick Hansen from Bitkom, everyone.